I know what you're all thinking right now. You're thinking, wow, this guy looks exactly like Channing Tatum. <laughs> Why are you laugh? Is it, is this better? <laughs> yeah? yeah, well, my looks have gotten me pretty far in my career. I've got to do a lot of things like kiss an alligator on a billboard. You notice you might have seen this, it's still up. Uh, some killer sideburns and an awesome mustache. Thank you. I think it's really from my father's genes. But of course, looks can only get you so far in this world. And so I combined forces with Paul Benedict and Brendan Dunphy to create the film company called Iowa Filmmakers. And together we've done a lot of work. And a couple of those pieces are Valentine Road, which is a prohibition era piece that takes place in Iowa that follows around two nefarious characters as they take adventures on the world in which rye whiskey is being made. And I have to say, playing the man in brown is an amazing experience. And then, of course, there's this, Marooned, which is our new television show we're, we're developing, which is about two actors from the coast who get stuck in Iowa <laughs> after the tax film credit scandal happens. Yes, it is a mockumentary set in the way of the office for Modern Family, and this also is a lot of fun. And then you might have seen this. The single most entertaining ad to come out of Iowa this political season was released today. It was made by a couple of Iowa filmmakers named Scott Sipker and Paul Benedict. It's called Iowa Nice. You heard we're a bunch of knee-jerk conservative reactionaries. I guess that's why we went Democratic in five out of the last six presidential elections. How are you like me now? <laughs> Parenthetically, I must tell you that I really like self-promotion. And so the fact that the president's head is bigger in this picture than mine really bothers me. <laughs> Though many of you are probably thinking right now, actually, Scott, your head is bigger than the president's. But how did I get here? How did I get to being a baby born by flashlight and Carol? This actually happened. This is a Des Moines Register headline from 1982. And in Carroll, the electricity was knocked out by a snowstorm, and also the generator broke. It's a great first day. How did I go from that to being a kid who grew up in a small town with 101 people and 26 pets to being right here in front of you, and it was because of ambition. And according to Webster's collection of words, ambition is a desire to achieve a particular end. So we're going to talk about two different things. We're going to talk about desire to achieve, and we're going to talk about a particular end, which I'm going to call objectives. So let's talk about objectives. Every day, we have thousands and thousands of little objectives, whether it's getting to work on time, or it's making sure we wore two black socks and not letting that sneaky black sock sneak in there, the navy one, I should say. We've all been there before. And also, maybe not losing your keys for the third time that week. And the thing is, is that it's not about the small objectives, of course. It's about the super objectives, those guiding posts of our lives. And I would say that happiness, like this little girl's experiencing in the leaves here, is really the motivation behind all of our objectives. And I put forth to you that to be happy, you must have an effective objective. So what makes an effective objective? You have to compose it. And yes, I word co use compose on purpose because we have very few things in our lives that we can control. What are the things we can control? Every single one of them falls into the category of our words or our actions. We cannot control whether our boss likes us at work. We cannot control if our daughter wants to become an MMA world champion. We cannot control whether there's a texter and driver who runs into your bumper. But you can't control how you act at work. You can't control the support structure in which you give your daughter. Maybe you want her to defeat Anderson Silva in a bout. <laughs> I don't know, it's up to you. And you can control how you drive. Now, another thing that we must accept before we move on is that the mistakes you have made in the past, you can't change them. 
and you can't go back. No matter how many times you drive 88 miles an hour, you cannot go back. And in the words of Shakespeare, I'm an actor, so I must quote Shakespeare, and he says, what's past is prologue. So let's finish the prologue, and let's move on to the story. So what can we can control? We can control our objectives, and I tell you an effective objective is one that is specific. Do you want to be the president of the United States? Do you want to be the evolutionary biology chair at Cambridge University? Do you want to break Jack Nicholas's 18 major championship record? You have to be specific. The more specific, the better. In golf, Harvey Pinnock, who is quite possibly the game's most storied teacher, had a philosophy of taking dead aim. And that's mostly said this way, that when a golfer gets onto a fairway or into a tee box, he looks out and he sees a 40-yard wide fairway. And he aims for that. Harvey Pinnock said, no, take a small spot way out into the fairway where you want the ball to end up and aim there. And I can attest, and I have the credentials to say that this works because in 2001, I was an all-conference golfer, Carroll High School, go Tigers. <laughs> Thank you. Now, let's say, for instance, you have a passion for cooking. And so you want to be a chef. That's wonderful. So what do you want to be? You want to be a French chef? Do you want to be the White House chef? Do you want to be a dessert guru? Well, with each detail that you decide, clarity will come with the path that you should take. So you want to be a French chef? Then you should watch Julia Child on Iowa Public Television. Also, where I host a show called Iowa Outdoors. Check your local <laughs> listings. <laughs> you want to be the White House chef? I don't know. I think it might be time for you to become friends with Mayor Cory Booker. Have you seen this guy? Man, he's, he rescues people from fires and he shovels snow. Check him out. Or if you want to be a dessert guru, you need to have somebody who will give you honest feedback, and there's somebody who's very good at this, Channing Tatum. <laughs> now, once you get to this point, you will find, without a doubt, that there will be gaps in the path that you take. And I'm telling you that the answer to every gap that you come to in your path will be the answer of a human relationship. Surround yourself with talented people and ask for help. This is exactly what Brendan Dunphy and I did when we wanted to make films, but we knew very little about how to do the technical aspects, aspects of film. So we contacted somebody who knew something about that, Paul Benedict. And now all three of us lean on each other. And I just want to point out how many human relationships we had to cultivate just to make this set of marooned happen. Now, desire. This seems like the easy one, right? We all desire to be happy, so it should be so. Well, there's something called hopelessness, OK? Now, with hopelessness, I must quote Little Texas. <laughs> a country band from the middle 90s who had a big hit called What Might Have Been. And this lamenting runs rampant through most people over the age of 25 because Dreams and aspirations were there for college and high school years, and then you graduate, and you find you're colonizing a planet called the real world. <laughs> or, of course, you have the worst case scenario, which is that you have a human being who is in a situation where their opportunity is as scarce as the food on their plate. Well, I'm here to tell you and give you evidence that even if you have literally nothing, you can create anything. I have nothing, I have nothing to show for myself, I have nothing to do. We have all heard these words or possibly said them ourselves. And that is terrible, we, we hate this of course. But I'm here to tell you that the conclusion that Parmenides, a Greek philosopher, he needs some sun I think, had, that from nothing comes nothing is wrong. And we need to look no further than all around us. Flashback, 13.7 billion years ago, there was absolutely nothing. No light, no hydrogen, no oxygen, no scar stars, no galaxies, nothing. And then with a silent 
very small, big bang, everything that would ever create was created. How did this happen? This seems completely counterintuitive, doesn't it? Well, Lee Krauss, in his book, A Universe from Nothing, who is the director of the Origins Project at Arizona State University, puts forth in his book many different pieces of evidence. And one of them is this amazing fact that nothing is unstable. Empty space is unstable. And he says that when you combine the laws of quantum mechanics with the laws of gravity, and you have it in empty space, and you wait long enough, particles will be created. If you wait long enough, empty space will create a universe full of matter. Now this seems counterintuitive. It seems like it violates the laws of energy conservation, but it's not because of this amazing fact that gravity has both positive and negative energy. And because of this, Krauss says that the universe can create these particles with impunity, and cosmologists think this happens today near black holes, and in fact it happens in empty space. So if nothing can create everything, and then something that you have, whether it just be brain function and motor capabilities, your something can create something. But what about the naysayers, those people who tell you you can't do something? Well, Einstein said that he disagreed with the origins of the universe in which I just described. He stuck his tongue out at it. Even though his formulas and calculations led to that conclusion, he thought that the universe was static and it was eternal. And if Albert Einstein, possibly the smartest individual to exist since Isaac Newton, can be wrong about something so big and important, then those people who tell you you can't do something because you're not smart enough, because you're too old and past your prime, because you're not talented enough, those people can be wrong too. In his last lecture series, Randy Pausch, a Carnegie Mellon professor who was terminally ill and now has passed away, talked about obstacles and he called them brick walls. And the brick walls, he said, are there for a reason, but it's not there for a reason that you think. They're there to show you, to show everybody how badly you want something. And they're there to stop those people who don't want it as bad. So the reason, Randy Pausch said, the brick walls were there is not to keep you out. They're there to keep other people out. So if you can, clean your slate by accepting those things you can and cannot control, accepting that you cannot change the past. If you can compose a specific objective, go after it with passionate desire and ask for help, then you can discover the secret. And the secret is this, that it is not about achieving your objectives, but it is pursuing them. That's where the goodies of life lie. Sure, it's wonderful to achieve your objectives, but once you get there, you have to set new ones. So to quote the great philosopher, Arrow Smith, <laughs> life's a journey, not a destination. And I'm here, if you will not take anything else away from today, please, please take this away that it is not too late to go after your childhood dreams or your adulthood aspirations. Because I put to you that the space between you and more happiness is ambition. Thank you.